Amen. I want to pray with you today before we start. And so are you ready? May the Lord speak to us. Amen. We are his sheep and we hear his voice. Amen. And we pray for that blessing this morning, Lord. That today we, your children, are gathered together as the chicks gather under the wings of Mother Hen. We gather under your wings. We gather in the shelter of your presence. We love you. We honor you. We exalt you, Lord. We worship you. We've come here not to hear the voice of a stranger. We've come here to hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord. Thunder in our hearts. Awaken our souls and our affections towards you, Lord. May our thoughts be illuminated with the brightness of the understanding of your word. Renewed so that our lives are transformed to love you and obey you and serve you, God. As the deer pants for water, so our soul longs for you. We love you and we want to live for you as we sang this morning. That I may live with you and for you. We come at this time into your hands and be glorified in the ministry of your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. And all people say, Amen. Amen. Today, I won't be doing like a Bible study. I want this, what I'm hoping to be and praying to be, a word of encouragement. You know, that this word would nudge you. And if the Lord wills to push you, more closer to the Lord. For some days now, I've been experiencing a greater grace to pray and to wait on God's presence. And I'm praying that that would be yours too in Jesus' name. That the Lord would enable you to just seek him with greater fervency. I want to share with you a word of encouragement of how we can move from wilderness to fruitfulness. Could you say that after me? From wilderness to fruitfulness. Why did you just turn and tell that to somebody? From wilderness to fruitfulness. Yes? So if you're in a, feeling like you're in a wilderness in this time of your life, you know, God wants the season to change. He doesn't want to keep you in the wilderness forever. He wants to bring you into a season of fruitfulness. Amen. But the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, can you pronounce that? <laughs> okay. When I was small, I had, younger, not smaller, younger, I had a lisp. I couldn't say shashi, I say sasi. <laughs> so for me, Ecclesiastes, it's really difficult, okay? So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says that there is a purpose for every season in life. See, you must know that. That there is a purpose in God for every season. No tear, no pain, no blessing, no season in your life is wasted. And I sense, and in in some ways, I believe this word is timely and prophetic. I sense we are in a very important pivotal seasons in our lives personally and cooperately as a church. The Holy Spirit is wanting to move powerfully in your life and through your life. Now, you must just have said right now, Shannon, I don't feel what you are talking about. But that's precisely the point. It's not what you and me are feeling, it's what God is going to do beyond what you are feeling or thinking right now. Amen. You know, if you get excited by something that you hear, you can shout at an amen. <laughs> you know, so this season and this time calls for an extended times of worship of prayer and waiting on God. 
Now you may feel that like how I have felt so many times that you are below the waves. You know, just imagine like you're in the sea. <laughs> Not a very nice place to be. But imagine you're in the sea and you know, the, you're, you know there are waves that go up and the waves that go down. You know the ebb and flow. And you probably feel in this season of your life that you're in the below. You know, you're down. But I believe that those waves are going to rise high. And God is going to catapult you into a place of breakthrough, blessing, and fruitfulness according to his plan for your life. But what is crucial is our understanding of the season we are in. Now this is vital to determine our response to God in that season. Now think about a farmer, you know. The onset of the monsoon has begun. Now think about a farmer in Punjab. Punjab the Puttar. Okay? Now all farmers, good mature farmers know there's a season to do everything. Now imagine there is Balbir Singh. Balle. And Balbir Singh says, I want to be different. Balle. And in the time of plowing, he's chilling. And in the time of sowing, which comes after the plowing, he goes on a holiday. And then the rain comes. And the rain comes and the rain has nothing to fall on in his land. Because he has plowed, not plowed the land, nor has he sown anything. And after the rains, when the harvest comes up in all the fields around Mr. Balbir's land, what do you think is the condition of his land? There's nothing. <clears throat> so beloved, don't be like Balbiri Singh. Be wise. Who is wise? One of the characteristics of maturity and wisdom is knowing which season are you in and what does God expect you to do in that season. And I'm asking you this morning, do you know which season of life you are in? And do you understand what is God expecting of you in this season in your life? Because an incorrect understanding of the season will result in an unhealthy response. If you don't understand the time and place that you are in your life, in the season when you see that other people are experiencing a harvest of God's blessing, you will have nothing. But that's not God's plan for your life. He wants you to move from a season of wilderness into a season of fruitfulness. Can I hear an amen to that? You know, one thing I've noticed that the reason many times, if not all the times, that people are not able to respond to God correctly in their season is because they don't have a proper view of God. It finally comes down to the issue of faith, of trusting in God, His word, His character, his promises. You see, if I have a proper view of God, I will stay focused on Him no matter what season I am in. And when I'm focused on God, He by His Spirit enables me to be in sync with Him and for me to know what He wants me to do in that season of my life. Now, we cannot escape the tests that are going to come in our life. I say that again. You cannot escape the tests that are going to come in your life. Nor can you shorten the time of your wilderness experience. I say that again. You cannot escape the test that's coming in your life. Nor can you shorten the time of your wilderness experience. But you can delay or lengthen your time in the wilderness by a wrong response. Did you hear that? Now, I don't have time to explain that through factual stories in the Bible. I can do that. If, if you want me to explain that, we need to have cup of chai together. 
okay? And I'll factually explain to you that if God determined a particular time and season for a test for a person or a people, they had to go through it. But many a time, because of an un incorrect understanding of the season, they delayed their time in the wilderness. Classic example, people of Israel in the desert. 11-day journey. A 11-day journey, man, hold your chair, was turned into a 40-year experience in the wilderness. That's how dangerous a wrong response to God can happen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, don't stop breathing. <laughs> now, I want to encourage you. I, don't want to, I didn't come here to give you Jurassic Park Part 4D experience. <laughs> okay? Yeah. God wants you to be successful in your tests. Remember what I told you that last time. He wants you to be successful, all right? So let's get wiser in God and let's believe God that he will help us to mature and he will bless us from this season to the next. Amen? Amen. So now there are four simple but absolutely important things that are true that you need to remind yourself of no matter which season you are in. <clears throat> Suppose you're sitting here and saying, Shannon, my wilderness got over last year. I am balle balle. I am going through great times. I got news for you. Enjoy. Prepare for the wilderness that's coming. Are you understanding? And if you are in a wilderness, be encouraged. It's going to come to an end. Okay? But here's the thing. Whether you are in a season of fruitfulness, blessing, or wilderness, these four things are essential. Turn to somebody again. And tell them these four things don't forget. <clears throat> okay? These are very essential. All right? It's very important. <clears throat> Number one. Okay, don't write. Listen, I'll send you the notes. All right? Don't, don't write. You know I send you the notes, right? Okay, I don't send you all the notes. Okay. <laughs> I'll send you all the notes. Okay? Just, I just want you to be focused unless you're writing something that God specifically saying. Here's the four things. Number one. Nothing and no one can separate you from God's love, his presence, and his destiny for your life. And you can shout at him, amen. Nothing. You know, I was reading Romans, and Romans 8, Paul reminds us about, he just lists out everything. He says there's absolutely nothing. Romans 8 he says this 37 to 39. He says this, nothing and no one. Can, let, 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 can you read that for me? You read it. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, one more, one more, one more. This is like worse than prep two. Just read it together properly. Here we go. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. There's absolutely no one and nothing that can separate you and me from the love of God, the presence of God. You need to know that. See, many times in the wilderness, we feel abandoned. We feel lonely. But loneliness is a feeling. You're not alone. God is with you. Amen. The second thing. God has already given you in Jesus all things that pertain to life and godliness. Amen. God has already given you all things. He's already given me all things. You know, everything that you need for this life to glorify him, to fulfill your purpose, to fulfill your destiny, he's already given it to you. Aapko mil gaya hai. All right. You know, believe that. 
and for godliness. First Peter chapter 1, 3 to 4. What, what does Peter write, the apostle? Can you read that for me? Here we go. 1, 2, 3. And God has already given you everything. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Can we just put that? All the promises of God are. And. Amen. God has already given you everything. That you need for this life. So number one. There's nothing and no one that can separate you from God's love. His presence and his destiny for you. Number two. God has already given you all things. Number three. Now this should bring a smile on your face. If God did not spare his son. To provide for your greatest need. That is to be saved from your sins. Will he not with him freely give you all good things? Yes. Romans 8, 31, 32 says that. I don't want to repeat that verse because that verse precisely says that. That God gave his son to meet our greatest need. So will not Papa give you everything? Will not Abba Father give you everything? Absolutely. Can you just repeat the three things now that I just shared with you? Quickly. Number one, there is no one and nothing that can, absolutely no one and nothing. You need to remember and remind yourself of this in every season of your life. Number two, God has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Number three, if God did not spare his son to provide for our greatest need, Will he not with him freely give you all good things? Number four. And this may feel like I'm putting you on a spot, but this is true. You alone are responsible for your choices and your destiny. I repeat that. You alone are responsible for your choices and destiny. Now, we have so much to thank God for. Amen? Because... You must, we must remind ourselves of where we are now is not where we were. Yes? And God is not unfaithful to leave you and me midway. Remember I told you about that flyover that starts somewhere and stops nowhere? You know, incomplete flyover. That is not God. What God starts, he finishes. Amen? He will see you through. <clears throat> so you're going to come through. I believe that for every one of you. And I'm praying that for you all. Each of you all. All of you. Your families and all those who are online. That God's going to come through for you. And you're going to grow from understanding to understanding. From faith to faith. And from glory to glory. And all of the trials and tests. And this wilderness is not to harm you. But to prepare you. For what God has prepared for you. Amen. Amen. Tell yourself, I'm being prepared by God. Learn to talk to yourself. Say, I'm being prepared by God for what God has prepared for me. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to take you into a quick uh, story from the Bible. One of the four or five favorite stories of my Anaya. When I would tell stories to my eyes, sometimes she goes, or like three months, I have to tell her the same story morning, afternoon, night. So she used to like Zacchaeus. I'm not telling you about Zacchaeus. Then she used to uh, like uh, the food being multiplied. And um, this was one of her favorite ones, what I'm going to tell you today. David at Ziklag. How many of you remember King David in the Bible? Ah, that's fantastic. <clears throat> you know, David had a precious calling from God to lead Israel. 
as their king, but in his time. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, he is introduced to us for the first time. And it is when the prophet Samuel, one of the greatest prophets of Israel, is sent by God to his father's house in order to anoint him to be the future king of Israel. I want you to try and ask the Holy Spirit to help you imagine what I'm saying. Just think about it, you know. The greatest prophet in Israel is sent to this, to, to this family and this is David's high moment. High moment. You know, Bible commentators have speculated that how come the father of David, that is Jesse, was being visited by the greatest prophet. The prophet specifically says, I want to meet your sons. And the father forgets or doesn't seem to take the initiative to call the youngest, David. If you had a prophet visiting your house, and suppose you had 15 children, no family planning, wouldn't you make sure that either by Dunzo or VFAS, they're all packed and brought home? I mean, somehow you will make sure that all the 15 are there because you want this prophet to lay his hands and pray and bless every one of them, yes or no? Absolutely, and this father seems unconcerned. And so, so Bible commentators or teachers speculated, why could it be like that? I don't want to say much. But this was David's high moment. How many of you remember your high moment with God? You know, I can remember certain instances in my life where it was my high moment. And I was like picked out out of a crowd and there was a prophet and, you know, I was pulled out in the front and a word of prophecy was, you know, I was like, man. You know, three days, I am not on earth. I'm somewhere in between. I'm excited. This is my high moment. Because this was David's high moment. The prophet Samuel had taken his flask of oil and poured on this young man. So you shall be the king of Israel. But what David didn't knew, even as the calling had got activated, what had begun was a long period of preparation and the silence of the lambs. <laughs> so years back, 2004 Feb, when I went to see God for some major decision in my life, I met with Pastor Cyril. And he sat me down and he said, Shannon, there are three things to fulfilling your God's plan and destiny for your life. First is the call. The second, I was not happy to hear. He said, the longest is the preparation and then comes the commissioning. I repeat, call, preparation, commissioning. I say it again, call, preparation, commission. Can you say it with me? Call. Can you say it a little louder? Call, preparation. Can you turn that to somebody and tell them quickly? Call. Like faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this, the greatest of the three is preparation. <laughs> you know, David loved God. He's the man I identify in the Bible. You know, you have your favorite Bible characters that you identify with. Maybe you identify with Ruth or you identify with, I don't know. I identify with David, a man after God's own heart, a man who loved God. He was brave, he was faithful in his family, and he was faithful in his daily responsibilities. And you know what somebody compliments about him when they want to introduce him to King Saul? Because King Saul is getting oppressed by demonic spirit and they want to introduce David. Now this is what somebody else is introducing David like. Look at what he says in 1 Samuel 16, 18. Then one of the young men responded and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a, va a valiant, mighty man, a warrior, Skillful in speech, 
a handsome man. Woo! And most important, and the Lord is with him. That should be the testimony of your life. Let not your own mouth praise you. Let somebody else's mouth praise you. Just an advice. You know, David won great victories for Israel as a soldier and then as a commander, beginning with the defeating of Goliath. That was his next high moment. Imagine, probably a 16-year-old, slow motion, Walt Disney pictures running, swinging. Yeah! It hits the mark. The giant is slain. David is a hero. Second high moment. But what David didn't know, he was just about to step into the season of wilderness and preparation. Welcome to the jungle. <clears throat> you know, he ministered personally to the king to bring him relief from demonic oppression. Yet in spite of all of the above, Bible teachers estimate that King Saul plotted and pursued to kill David. To what? To kill David and had him running for about seven years. How many years? Seven years. What was David's profile? What was his biodata? What you just read? Loved by God, skillful, valiant, brave, handsome. And most importantly, who's with him? How can this be? The preparation and the experience doesn't seem to be matching the calling. No, it is. That's the problem. We think... That we, sh we should not be going through a wilderness. How many of you would sign up? What if we had a counter at the back and say, okay, everybody, please volunteer and sign up. How many of you would like to go through the wilderness experience? How many of you would like to not go through the wilderness experience? Let's check the lines. But you know, beloved, it is in those days and in th that period of your life that you will come closer to the Lord like never before. That you will come to know the Lord. That you will begin to draw near to him. You will see him, experience him. Like you have not in other seasons of your life. And God will work in you. And God will mature you. And God will prepare you. That through the entire wilderness experience, not for a moment will he forsake you. That God is with you in every step. In those seven years of wilderness... God protected, provided, blessed, and more than anything, prepared David. Now, let me come to the main climax part. And, you know, one of the things that Abel was, David was able to do in those seven years is he was able to raise up an army of 600 men. I mean, these were all the bad guys of Israel, all the good-for-nothing fellows, all the... Pardon me for saying, but Lucas, you know, all the, you know, I don't want these guys kind of type. All of them heard there was a guy in the wilderness and they heard that the anointing of God is on this person. The, the power of God is on this person. The calling of God is on this person. And they all went there. You know what David did? I mean, just imagine the wisdom of God on David, the grace of God. He trained these men to be the best of the best. So best that their names are in the Bible. Okay? He trained them up to be a discipline. The Bible says he made them disciplined. He made them skillful. He made them organized. They were the best fighting team probably on the earth at that time. 600 men were trained. His credibility was growing as a brave leader. His character was growing. And yet David and these 600 men were living like nomads, no place to stay. We we're just moving from place to place. Till one day, a Philistine king gives them a city. Turn to somebody and say, he finally got a city. <clears throat> okay. What was the name of the city? Ziklag. And so these 600 men with David, with their families, they finally settled down in a city. Ah, 
Seems like the season had changed. Right? Ha, ah, finally got a city. Finally. Whew. Picket fences, the American dream. You know? Halls. Oh, cool, nice. But God didn't say city. He said kingdom. You're trying to plant picket fences. You don't imagine what he has for you. You must know that the keys to your palace are in the prison. Joseph. And the path to fruitfulness is through the wilderness. So when these guys were just settling in and David is in his rocking chair. God said, burn the city. Gaston doesn't know whether to sit or run from here. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, the worst thing happens. The worst thing. The Amalekites, I don't want to talk about them or explain about them. They were distant relatives. But Amalekites came and attacked the city of Ziklag when David and his men were not in Ziklag. They had gone for a military expedition and so who was left behind? The women, the children, uh, maybe the maidservants, the, the elderly, they were all there. And that's what the Amalekites were known for. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, in the desert, in the 40 years, the Amalekites would come at the back and attack. They would attack the weak, the vulnerable, the helpless. And that was their trademark. That was their quality, characteristic. And here again in Ziklag, they must have kept an eye. And when David and his men were out there, far away, they came, they attacked the city, they took captive all the loved ones, all the family members, and burned the city up. And imagine the horror as David and his men are riding back, and from a distance, they see the whole city in flames and burning. What do you think must have gone through them? The horror, the pain, the anger, the revulsion, the sense of revenge. But the most difficult thing is when they came back, is that David's own men turned against him. These same 600 men that he had trained turned against him. Now, listen to what I'm saying here, beloved. And this may not be true for all of you, but at some point of time, maybe it may become true for you. Your greatest test will come when you are about to come out of the season of your wilderness. I say that again. Your greatest test will come when you are about to come out of the season of your wilderness into a season of increased unparalleled fruitfulness. What David and his men didn't know, David didn't know, his men didn't know, nobody knew, A, that God was not only going to give back and help him defeat the enemy and give them back all that they lost, yep. But number two, he was going to give him more than what he had lost. Number three, even more significantly, God was going to open the door for David to become the king immediately after this victory. So that prophecy and that calling that years before was spoken over his life was now going to come to pass. You know why? Because now David was prepared to serve not himself, but to serve God and his people as a king. Make sense? So I say again, all the trials, tests, and wilderness in your life is not to harm you, but to prepare you for what God has prepared. Now here's the essence of what I'm saying. You see, all that David had gone through in all those previous years, and I wish I had time to explain all the different incidents in his life, you know, where he experienced God in the daily details and struggles and battles and joys and sorrows of his life. You know, I still remember when he came to King Saul being introduced for the first time. And, uh, you know, Saul is, you know, when, they, when Goliath is challenging them and David is brought before the king. He's a young lad. He's probably in his late teenage years. And Saul looks at him and says, you, you're going to go?
to kill the giant and and this is what david says he says the lord who has helped me kill the lion and the bear will help me strike down this goliath and you see how david is referring to his training in god his preparation is god he's saying king saul i'm a man who's been trained by god i'm a man who's been prepared by god i don't depend on sword and spear i depend on the lord and that should be your testimony that happens in the wilderness if you're not in the wilderness then you're depending on sword and spear and your connections and your contacts and your resources and god said i don't need that you need one thing to fulfill your destiny you need me and that simple but powerful lesson is learned not sitting on a couch not in the season of blessing it's learned in the season of the wilderness because in the wilderness there is no resource there is no connections there is no contacts there's nothing to turn to there's nobody to phone call there's nobody to text there's nothing to entertain you dude god wants to take you into the wilderness not to harm you but to prepare you because god doesn't want to lose you by using you he doesn't want the success to destroy you he wants you to be blessed to be a blessing and david was finally ready but you know what was that moment i listen carefully and i'm going to in my next message when i talk about it i will explain this one thing that i'm going to leave as a seed to you right now you see there's this moment in first samuel 30 and you know what this he heard you know firstly they're seeing the city burn down and his wives are not there his children are not there the men are weeping their families are gone the city is burned up picket fences have all got burnt nothing there and the one of the most painful things he hears is his own men talk about stoning him those whole 600 men they turn against him we don't know how many but maybe many of them what was david going to do now you and i know the story but david didn't know what was going to happen this was the moment a wrong response in the time of testing will result in disaster what were the choices he could grumble mama attack his own men he was a warrior finally he could have attacked his own men there could have been mutiny over there civil war he could have walked away disguised as get lost i don't want anything i don't want to have anything to do with you walk away that's the easiest thing walk away but david did something that you and i should learn to do first samuel chapter 30 verse 6 this changes everything you know everything in your life hinges on this because at that time the enemy will try and whisper he's not good he loves them he doesn't love you oh yeah he is good You know one of the most frequent lies I have heard of the enemy let me share with you I've never shared with you Shannon God is good but not with you So I'm theologically right you know but not right yet Shannon God loves everyone this is what the enemy tells me he loves everyone he loves sneha blessing and tishila selin but he doesn't love you 
And Shannon has a choice to believe that lie or to say, Lord, no one and nothing can separate me from your love and your presence. You've given me all things in Jesus for life and godliness. Amen. And I'm going to make a good choice. Because all your promises are yes and amen. I'm going to make a good choice. To remind myself of your love, and your plan and your destiny for my life. I'm going to praise you no matter what. You know Gaston, I still remember February 8th when you sent me the song list. And the offering song in Country Club on that Sunday, Feb 2020, was Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. You may not remember, Sneha was leading. And as I sang the song, you give and take away, you give and take away. I was very conscious. Do you know there are churches that have decided to not sing that line? Because they believe in the New Testament, God does not take with you. Man, what kind of Bible are you reading? I've known of churches who have stopped singing, you give and take away. They say, God doesn't take, he only gives. You crazy? The wilderness in your life is not to hurt, to harm you, but to prepare you. I want to tell you something, God takes. But he gives you far more than what he's taken. He burned Ziklag. He allowed Ziklag to be burned because he didn't want David to be limited as Ziklag. God's plan was not only Ziklag. God's plan was the nation and the nations. That 3,000 years later in a hall in seven bungalows that we would be talking about David and Ziklag to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And David strengthened himself in the Lord. The next time I'm going to share with you something very special about this aspect. But I want to encourage you this morning, beloved. Learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Learn to speak to yourself. Why you cast down, O my soul, hope in the Lord, for I shall yet trust him. I will not die, but I will live to declare that my God is upright. Oh, bless the Lord with me and let us magnify his name together. Learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Don't give up. Because even if your greatest test comes at the end of the wilderness, it may seem that everything, imagine what David must have felt at that time. And just think of that moment. He, he must have thought, everything that I worked for, I've lost it in just, it's just gone. In a day, it's just gone. But what he didn't know, that what was burned to ashes, God was going to raise up something new. And David didn't know that. But he did the one right thing. You may not know what God has for you. And that's understandable. He doesn't want you to know that. But he wants you to know that he's with you. I want to ask you this morning, will you trust him? Will you exalt him? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Nothing and no one can separate you from God, his love, his presence, his promises. God has already given you everything in Jesus for this life and godliness. If God did not spare his son to meet your greatest need, will he not with him freely give you all good things? And number four, don't blame others. Don't blame circumstances. You make the good choice to strengthen yourself in the Lord and see how God changes your season from wilderness to fruitfulness. Can we all stand together? Come on. So let's sing the first song together. I love that song. And I'm so thankful, Gaston, you took the song. You're so nice. You're like the best worship team in the whole world. <laughs> Thank you. I love that song. Amen. Lift your hands and bless the name of the Lord together. Come on, before we sing the song, just tell the Lord and express that, Lord, I trust you. I love you. I believe in your promises. I believe in your word. I believe in who you are, that you are good, that you are faithful. Come on, just lift your voices and bless his name together. Thank you, God. You are good. Your mercy endures forever. You're true to all generations. I exalt you, my God. I magnify you. I speak to my soul. Don't be cast down. Don't be discouraged. Hope in the Lord, for I shall yet trust him. I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How great is your love. How great is your mercy. 
How great is your grace. How great is your faithfulness. How great is your goodness that you have stored up for us, Lord. We exalt you, O oh God. We bless your name. We bless your name. We magnify you, O oh God. We exalt you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Come on, let's do it together, beloved. Lift your voices. Even those of you who are at home or outside, just watching online, just try to lift up the Lord together. Magnify you, God. We bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Oh, we magnify you. We exalt you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. We exalt you, Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I don't think blessing is on. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Let's do it together. अपने जीवन में दुनिया बदलती है तू ना बदलता बंद आंखों से भी मैं करता भरोसा विश्वास विश्वास योग्य परमेश्वर है तू देखा है मैंने अपने जीवन में दुनिया बदलती है तू ना बदलता से भी मैं करता भरोसा इंसानों से तू हर
Yes, Lord, who is like unto you, God, faithful and true, truly God, friend and foe may leave, but you never leave. You hold us in the palm of your hand, and we thank you this morning that you have reminded us of your great love, of your call and your plan for our lives. You love us, you care for us. And I thank you for your affirmation. We thank you for your word. And I pray that in this time and season of our lives, for each and all of us, that there would be a release of grace to seek your face in unusual ways, that we would be able to push the limitations and break through to be able to seek your heart and to seek your face, that you would enable us to make the time, put the effort, to seek your face, to wait in your presence, and to allow you to do what only you can do. And if the only one thing that you want to do is to draw us closer to you, that you would have us fall in love with you all over again, let it be so, Lord, that you would be our first love, our greatest joy, our deepest satisfying pleasure. We love you, Lord. I thank you, God, for your people this morning. Every family that is represented here, Father, I pray that you would bless them. Bless them with your healing. Bless them with good health. Bless them, oh God. We remember Arun's father who's recovering from the bypass surgery. We remember Anthony who's recovering from his heart surgery. We just want to thank you, God, that you love these precious men and these precious families. And God, that you will heal them and make them whole, oh God. Thank you for everything that you have done for us and all that you're doing. We will value the season of preparation, knowing that you are preparing us for what you have prepared for us. So to you be all the glory. Can you join me for one more time before we close? Lifting your hands and say, to you be all the glory, God. All the honor all the praise and all the worship now and always in the name of our lord jesus we pray and the people said can we give the lord a hand of praise amen <laughs>